morning, everyone, and welcome to today's meeting of the Scrutiny Commission. As usual, this meeting is being broadcast live to the public. For those not able to watch live, the webcast will be recorded and made available for viewing on the County Council's website after the meeting. I've been advised of two substitutions for today. Mr Smith is substituting for Mrs Fryer and Mr Allen is substituting for Mr Morgan. We have also had apologies from Mr Gillard and Mr Richardson. Uh, before we begin, can I please remind everyone to turn on their microphones only when you wish or invited to speak. Obviously today our thoughts, are, as, as have been over the last few weeks, are with the people of the Ukraine at this very difficult time for them um, at present. So we move on to item one, which is the minutes from the last meeting held on the 31st of January. I move that these are taken as read, confirmed and signed. Is that agreed? Okay, item two is question time. I've not been advised of any questions from the public, which means we move on to item three, which is questions asked by members understanding order number seven. I've not received any such questions. Item four, we have no urgent items. Item five, we have declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest they wish to declare to the meeting? Nope, okay, so it moves us on to item number six, which is declarations of the party whip. Do any members wish to declare the party whip? No. OK, so item seven and we haven't received any petitions either. So therefore we move on to item eight, which is the first substantive item on the agenda today, which is the report of the scrutiny task and finish group on the council's corporate ways of working program, which starts on page 15 of the agenda pack. Uh, Mr Fillimore, the chairman of the group, is in attendance to present its findings which is recommended are substitute, submitted to the Director of Corporate Resources and the lead member for Ways of Working for Consideration. Uh, Mr. Fillimore, if you wish to go ahead, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening. Good evening. No, good morning, members and, and officers, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I am very pleased to introduce the report and recommendations of the Task and Finish Group established last year to look at the Council's Corporate Ways of Working programme. The programme will see a significant shift in how the Council operates and members were keen to understand the impact on this, sorry, of this and on staff and how they might engage both with each other to ensure a coordinated and joined up approach, but also with residents and service users and elected members. As the report makes clear, the group chose to focus on the people element of the programme, it being of the view that the workplace and technology elements will flow from that in time as the programme is rolled out. Whilst the financial savings identified are important, and I'm aware that you have a separate report in your agenda to look at how these will be delivered, the key benefits of adopting a hybrid working approach are much wider than that, and the group felt strongly that if the people element of the programme was not delivered well, irrespective of the savings, the authority, its staff and service users could be negatively affected. We had a detailed discussion on many areas, the group putting forward a number of challenges and identify key risks. Officers were able to offer significant reassurance on many issues. However, the group made several recommendations, which it is hoped will aid the successful delivery of the programme. It is necessary for the Council to move forward and embrace the opportunities that technology can now offer and to not lose the momentum of the work undertaken in response to the COVID pandemic. The Authority has done well to get to where it is so quickly during what has been a very difficult time. On behalf of the group, I wish to give good credit to the Council's staff, managers and fellow members who have played their part in embracing the changes required. It is important that we now keep and take forward what is good about those changes for the benefit of the organisation and the people it serves to their full potential. Um, I would ask the Commission supports the recommendations as set out in the agenda pack um, and these be passed on to the lead member and director for consideration. But what I would like to do in members from the chair's um, permission is actually just put a little bit of embellishment around some of the points that we've raised. So um, we cannot stress enough how critical the role of the managers will be 
in managing either a remote or a hybrid workforce. And we, we, we adopted a very helpful phrase, which is sense checking. And that was just literally just sense check everything that we do, everything that evolves, everything that is said, every piece of communication, um, really to ensure, if nothing else, that you know, we're not campus centric. We have a huge remote workforce. Um, many, many people never set foot in this building. Um, and we, we, as we move forward, we need to ensure that those communications and the ways of working that we will be adopting actually accommodate and capture those staff members who actually never set foot in this building. So um, sense checking, I think, is, is our adopted um, sort of philosophy on, on how everything goes forward. Um, clearly, as is set out in the report, um, there is a need for a whole council approach. Service outcomes must be the priority. Communication and collaboration is essential. Team cohesion and support. Of course, all our staff will be now, or many of our staff will be working in a different way, in a different style of working and interfacing with their colleagues less or more, depending on how the changes um, take effect. Um, learning and development of new offices. Um, critical point that was identified is as new members of staff come on stream, how do we onboard them? How do we induct them? If we're not in this old world of every being cam everything being campus centric, um, if we're bringing in people to a hybrid working system, what does that induction and onboarding process look like? Because the normal peer to peer support won't always be available. So uh, really close focus on that bit. Uh, staff wellbeing, of course, absolutely critical. Um, wider staff impacts, and, and that was really picked up and flows into the confidentiality, the health and safety and the productivity and performance. So wider staff impacts is if we have members of staff working from home, there will inevitably be an impact on their domestic circumstances as well. And we need to be conscious that as we adopt remote working or hybrid working, what those potential impacts look like. Um, so it, there, there is a very specific recommendation that we would very clearly wish to see adopted. Um, we then move into the issues about confidentiality. If we have people working from home and they are normally used historically, they work from here and they've got a nice drawer where they can lock and keep confidential information. If they're now working from home, what does that security look like and confidentiality protection? Uh, similarly, for health and safety, um, you know, if people are working in a um, council-owned environment, then we clearly carry all the liabilities. If they're working from home, what does that health and safety responsibility look like? Um, and I know, you know Gordon and David on my right have, have picked those points up um, very specifically to, to ensure that they are there. And then, of course, finally, productive and performance. How does that get managed? How does it get monitored? What does that look like going forward? Um, and again, with Chair's permission, um, if I can just briefly run through some of the recommendations. Thank you. Um, so communications we've already discussed, which was recommendation A. Um, right, recommendation C, service heads be requested to review their action plans as their teams work and arrangements evolve. So clearly, you know, we've gone through two years of, of very disruptive working. Um, new ways of working will evolve over time and it's absolutely critical that as that evolution takes place and further evolution takes place that actually there's a mechanism to keep, I'm going to use the phrase, sense checking. Is it still fit for purpose? Is it doing the right thing? Is it asking the right questions? Is it delivering the right outcomes? Uh, the communication we've covered. Um, uh, recommendation E, information be regularly shared with all staff around new and creative ways to come together. And again, this is really critical that we keep those communication lines open and information flowing um, and people understand our people, our staff understand what is happening, why things are happening and they join us on the journey. Uh, um, where we did I um, think there's a huge opportunity and it fits in feed back into this this um, wider impact on uh, people's domestic lives is all our staff annual, have annual reviews 
um, with their um, heads of departments and managers. Um, there is a great opportunity within those annual reviews to ask some softer questions about how is it working? Is it comfortable at home? You know, I've got, um, as a very simple example, I've got a headset here. The reason I have a headset is, um, I'm going to meet you straight after this, but um, I do work from home. My wife has recently changed her job and she's now at home more often. Um, actually, it's not right that she can hear what's being talked about on here. So actually, these become essential to keep some of that uh, confidential discussion um, away from other people in the house. Um, now, my wife's highly confidential anyway by the very nature of what she does, but it's the principle that um, I would like to highlight that just says, if we have people working from home, how do we ensure and maintain confidentiality? But also in those pers P um, personal re annual reviews, we, we talk to our staff and we understand how the changes of their working behaviours and practices are or potentially are impacting their domestic life. Because that is critical. Um, so that uh, was a really big opportunity that we identified to use in your reviews. Um, health and safety we've covered. And I think members, officers, that's all I would particularly like to comment. Um, David and, and Gordon on my right were superbly informative um, and done a huge amount of work um, and were able to talk us as, as a task and finish group through uh, a monumental amount of work clearly and cohesively and sensibly that we've made it really easy to understand um, but equally really easy for us to put challenge towards them um, and I think um, as a kind I guess the outside person looking in um, it seems very sensible and absolutely the right thing to do that we've kicked this into a task and finish group from the scrutiny aspect to actually just sense check have another view take a different position um perhaps some different challenges and i have to say members and, and david and gordon know if ever i could work on a task and finish group um i spent 25 years of my life in remote management so this was so far up my street it's hard to explain but I think the team, the task and finish group, really enjoyed it, thoroughly useful. Um, hats off to David and, and Gordon for uh, developing a, a, a significantly good programme. Um, but there are bits that we would like you to take forward. Thank you, Chair. Any questions? Uh, yes, Mr Pendleton. Thank you, Chairman. I, I'm really heartened by what I see. Um, and by the flexibility um, that we're uh, getting into uh, our way of working. I, I take my hat off uh, to the team. Um, it really is super. And, you know, we're, we're not uh, newbies at this. We are, we, we've got a track record and it's good. To the nitty gritty chairman, if I were, um, what shall I say? If, if I wanted to take my children to school at um, nine o'clock, would I, would I be penalised for not logging on until 9.20? Um, it's a simple thing, but it's, it's something which might cause me an awful lot of problem. And I might, in the end, decide, do you know what? It's not worth it if I've got to log on at nine. I'm going to resign. Now, that's a simple, practical thing. Can I ask um, our, our officers, um, have, have they built that in already? Yeah, if I can pick that up briefly, I think this is all about um, service needs first. Um, so what type of service am I in? And, and actually, could we facilitate that flexibility? Um, and, you know, the flexibility right across the service as well. Um, but then it's about those good quality individual management conversations, coming back to the point around the importance of managers. So being able to have that open conversation to say, is it an issue? How flexible can I be? Because we've got such a wide range of roles and wide range of service provision, customer requirements, etc. That there will be differences across the council, but it's about those individual conversations. So we shouldn't get into the position where somebody is saying, "Well, I'm going to do it." My manager doesn't even know I'm putting myself at risk. Not naive about that, though. <laughs> but that's that should be the starting point. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Payne. 
Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Fillimore, and everybody else who was involved on the task panel, and obviously the officers. I think this has is a really, really uh, good and comprehensive report, and uh, I think um, I kept thinking, where, what else is missing? And uh, I can only think of one small thing that is missing, and that is social interactions. So how do we cover social interactions? Because when we're all coming in, this is one thing we do. This is the wonderful thing. Now, I know that is one thing I've missed over the last two years. Uh, you know, I was talking to my washing machine. So how is, you know, how are we going to cover that off? Because social interactions filter into mental well-being. And my second question is, I see this report as a beginning, not as an end. So how do you think we can take it forward? What are the next steps? So do we you know, talk me through the next steps. Thank you. So I pick up the, the, the first one just around social interactions. I absolutely agree. Um, we, we've missed out on that with the kind of compulsory working at a distance, let's call it. Um, a big part of the action planning that we've asked services to do is about what we've kind of loosely branded as hybrid working, and that is about when is it important or from a business perspective when is it needed to get people together now that could be customer point of view it could be because it's a particular task which is easier to get people together for but it's also for um, networking um, for people's mental well-being positive mental health um, getting to know colleagues as, as mr Fillimore said you know it's much easier to induct people face to face so there will be lots of situations where it is more important to get together um, and we're facilitating the workplace so that, that people can do that in various ways um, so yeah really important point um, and I, th I think if it's not overt in the report it certainly sits as a as a core um, in terms of it being the beginning, not the end, absolutely. And, and we're at the point of bringing this to life now. Um, and we've got various, we've got senior managers briefing on Friday and then various bits of communication and engagement after that. David's been involved in talking to departmental management teams around next steps. So as we bring this to life, we're going to keep it under close review. We've got a pilot of a future office model that will be in room 700, where environment and transport currently are from April, May onwards. Um, we're going to invite members to have a look at that so you get a real idea of, 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 of in, in, in reality, if you like. Um, but we need to review the potential benefits, financial and non-financial, and keep those under close sort of close watch. Don't know, David, if you want to, to add anything. No doubt. Uh, just the only one I'd add is on the, uh, the socialisation part. We did a lot of work. Um, throughout 2020 and 2021 to give communication guidance to staff once the restrictions started to ease around the pandemic. We've got a lot of really good stuff out there and we'll be using that to inform as well. So you can meet um, not just obviously in an office location, you can meet um, in other places as well. So that will form a key part of our, our communication strategy. And like Gordon said, that's that's kicking off on Friday to our senior managers. May I just come back? Now, one of you, you're talking about inductions. One of the things is that I found um, it, it was always very difficult for staff who are not people in the top tier as officers work with members and they're fully well aware of the member officer relationship and that we are a public authorities, what members are doing, etc. But when you are going to go a little bit wider in the working system, um, people don't seem to be aware that they're counsellors. So sometimes through the uh, system, um, you know, walking in the corridor, you know, I speak regularly with the lady in the canteen and whatever. So if you don't have that social interaction, how do people know that they work for a public authority? And how, do you still feed that into the uh, induction process so they know uh you know how the system works and again thank you yeah just just oh sorry yeah thanks Colin. um so um just picking up on mrs page's comments um i um 
as, as a member of this this tax and finish group. Um, I, I come back to the, the, the elements within the, the report, and that is one, it's evolutionary and things will change. And that lovely phrase I keep emphasising, sense checking. We have to constantly sense check everything we do as things evolve and materialise. And social interaction, um, team cohesion, um, human behaviour was absolutely some of the areas that we picked up and looked at. Um, I know from different worlds that I, I live and work in, um, there is a fundamentally different um, level of discussion into relationship and everything else when it's in person um, and in team and in group than there is when it's, you know, the, the, the team starts at nine and it finishes at 10 and that's it. You don't get those ad hoc tangent conversations. So I'm confident um, as a member of the task and finish group that the officers have that very much in their sights um, and those working practices and disciplines. And it comes back to the key critical role of the managers. Managers have to be in a position to recognise that those team cohesion aspects um, are so critical to um, to the system. So, um, Gordon, I think you wanted to come back. Yeah, just just briefly on the, on the, the sort of understanding of member role. I mean, I think we we have reviewed um, induction content, and there's, there's a wide range of things which staff at different levels need to know. And I suppose. One thing is we just need to recognise that there will be, the best way to describe it, different kind of spheres of, of, of what's important to people, you know, based on their, their role. So a home carer, for example, their world is over here and the importance is, is, is clients locally. And they may have some understanding of the governance and what happens. And for people who are perhaps closer to the centre, if you like, it becomes increasingly important. You certainly built something in around, you know, Loosely called the running of a local authority, but it, it'll, it'll mean different things. But I think it is very, very important because we as members uh, need officers to support us to deliver our role. And if you can't raise that member of staff for seven days or, you know, you've been put it in, you know, so you, it is very important that all members of staff do know that councillors do have a role and that they need to be supported and that we do not work in silos and that we all have a got. A, uh, a shareholder, which is the general public who pays our wages. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I realise we're scrutinising scrutiny here rather, but OK, if I just take in Mr Poland and Mr Barclay quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, as Minister, for the report. It was a really interesting read. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that, that homeworking is the future. I think with this and a, a good number of different things that's happened as a result of the pandemic, I don't think they were caused by the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has brought them forward a significant number of years to what I probably would have happened anyway. Um, in terms of the challenges that's been talked about, in terms of integrating staff and training staff, that is going to be one of the the, the challenges that we have but obviously with the opportunities in terms of downsizing premises reducing costs um but in my, my question really is around recruitment of staff so uh mr pendleton talked about the potential to, to lose staff if it did because you can go to another company or another organization anywhere else but does that work for us as well so obviously up to now you work at County Hall, you have to live within reasonable commuting distance of County Hall. But in a world where you never go to County Hall because you work at home, um, could you work, could we recruit people literally anywhere, sitting in Scotland, Devon, wherever? Um, and really, I just wondered if that's sort of been explored and as a concept, because I can certainly see that as a great advantage, because suddenly your pool of talent becomes the whole country. But on the other hand, uh, this, especially given what we do as an organisation, are there things that really would benefit from having that local knowledge? So I guess my question, Chair, is: is is have they thought? Have you thought about having a geographical restriction on recruitment? Either way, and if, if so, why not? And and would that be something that 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 would be considered beneficial, really? I think it's a really good question, and it is something that we're considering. Um, not least because everybody else is. Um, and there will be certain roles where that's not 
that's not possible. We need people to be in the workplace um, for at least some of the time. At the moment, we don't have any roles that are fully you know, contractually home working. That may change in the future. Um, the, the bit in the middle is there will be some roles where we can work much more flexibly. We've got lots of roles that we drift onto this too much, but from a workforce challenge perspective, we've got huge you know, recruitment and retention challenges. It just reflects the national picture. So it's in our interest to um, broaden our pool as far as we can. So if, for example, we were recruiting somebody from you know, Southern England, into Scotland, whatever, and we said, you know, we do need to come into the office, but it's going to be once every couple of weeks or something, and we get the marketing right in the, in the advert, then we're widening our pool. Um, there's always a balance between the flexibility that that person has compared to the team that they're working with. So, you know, there's some sophistication to working that through, but we can't afford not to do it. And we have had those conversations. Want to briefly come in, Mr. Barkley? Yeah, yeah just, just to say really, I thought it was an excellent report. I think it identified all the issues. Um, but with 6,200 employees, uh, we are going to evolve and adapt. And as has been said, the manager's role is critical. And there's a wide range of personal circumstances and actually departmental circumstances which need to be considered. And it is not possible to just have one thing for everything. And I think that's been acknowledged and the role of the managers has been acknowledged and probably sharing best practice among the managers is is important. But really good work. Um, I was looking hard for something that I hadn't considered. I, I couldn't think of anything. Really good, really good report. Right. Does anyone want? Did you want to come in, Mr. Becker? Yeah. Could, could I just? Uh, I, I mean, I was asked to attend this morning on behalf of Peter Bedford, who's obviously lead member for post-COVID recovery and ways of working, and he just wanted to read a brief statement. Um, on his behalf. Uh, he apologised for not being here with you today because he actually has COVID, so uh, I hope he gets better soon. Um, he wished to thank councillors Fillymore, Bolter, King, Fryer and Frisbee for their work on the task and finishing group and the report that's here today, and to Gordon and David for their continued support in implementing these important reforms. We all know the financial challenges facing LCC and Peter believes that this programme will be instrumental in helping the authority to close the funding gap over the medium term. In particular, the opportunities for income generation, reduction in building operating costs, day-to-day -day operational savings and capital receipts. When taken together, we'll help to ensure that savings are made and that services are protected. As lead member, Peter continues to work closely with officers to manage the key risks outlined in the report, in particularly staff behavioural and cultural changes, as well as the ongoing work to ensure the county council is maximising its income from partnership working. He looks forward to all member briefings that's scheduled for May, which all members and also at which point all members will be invited on a tour of the new collaborative workspace room 700 being piloted. So, I mean, on my point, I, th I think Les used the word journey and I think what a journey we've been on together so far as staff and members and I think the journey is still continuing. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Fillimore and the other members of the group for all your work in taking a short but in-depth look at the, the programme at the request of the commissioners last autumn and to David and Gordon for your assistance on this as well and answering questions today. Um, and therefore, I take it that we're happy for the group's recommendations to be passed on uh, for consideration by the director and lead member. Thank you very much, uh, everyone who contributed on that item. Next item is number nine, and we have the related report on the Corporate Ways of Working programme, Delivery of Financial Savings, which is on pages 37 to 42 of the agenda pack. Gordon McFarclan, uh, the Assistant Director for Corporate Services will introduce this item and he's supported by David Scott, change leader in the transformation unit. The lead member for resources, Mr Brecken, is also in attendance for this item on behalf of Mr Bedford, the lead member for post-COVID recovery and ways of working. As we hear, he's unfortunately unable to attend today due to ill health. Um, so, Mr McFarlane, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'll just, I'm not going to go through every detail of the report, but just it's hopefully it's, it's been helpful to have that debate and I've said of the task and finish group report. I think it helps set the context for, for this um, report. So we worked through um, a lot of detail um, about the, the plan and potential benefits of this programme. 
um, together with the investment required. And that's been, as the report says, reflected in the new MTFS, which was agreed last month at the Council. Um, and whilst there's a wide range of benefits, um, we we'll focus on the financial savings and the opportunities, and we've split those into three categories. So income generation, uh, reduction in building operating costs, and operational savings. And then if we jump to paragraphs 9 to 14, um, we've, we've just got a little bit more detail around those three those three headlines, if you like. So a, a, a bit of a summary of, of what we mean by that. So we look at it, income generation, um, we'll be using using the County Hall campus as an example, we'll be using less space. So we have the ability to um, rent out um, an increased amount of space. Um, and we've got some predictions about future rental income. We're talking at the moment to potential um, tenants, um, and there has been interest um, in, from the public sector tenants no formal agreements you'll understand the, the kind of commercial sensitivity there but um, very positive conversations in, in, in a very uncertain world around how people will use buildings in the future so we're, we're, we're confident um, about increasing our income um, and we're projecting that over the next eight years rather than just the four years um, life of the MTFS um, because it's it's sensible to live long term, particularly when we're looking at, at property um, reductions and and using it in different ways. Um, we're starting to look a little bit around opportunities for commercialisation. So how do we use County Hall? How do we use the campus to further generate income? Um, very, very early days for those conversations. Um, we can certainly talk about some detail further down the line, which I think links to the point around you know, as we as we bring this program to life, we need to continue to review it in, in all aspects. Um, paragraphs 11 to 13, um, reduction in building operating costs. So again, moving to a hybrid working model, we will not, <coughs> excuse me, not be using our buildings to the same extent that we did pre-COVID. Um, and although we had plans to reduce those plans, as, as Mr. Bartley said, have rightly been accelerated. Um, and you can see that there's a, a couple of examples there where we've exited from existing buildings under paragraph 11. And we're in the midst of, of again, commercial negotiations around other tenancies and for these reasons haven't um, articulated those in the report. Um, and we're anticipating additional um, savings to the tune of just under 300,000 a year. 24, 25, sort of think of the length of the leases and when we can legitimately come out of those without incurring additional cost. Um, and then that's balanced out by some other uh, increase, slight increase in cost um, to accommodate um, additional staffing in, in other areas. Um, so you can see that the detail of the um, net cost reductions just imported from the, from the MTFS. And again, projected that over the next eight years and we'll keep those figures up to date as as you know look at the realities of, of what's happening but those are our best um costed estimates for, for now and then paragraph 14 operational savings um things like business travel which clearly went down dramatically during covid during covid has started to come up again but should stabilize at a, at a level that's significantly below what it was pre-covid um, so we're just being a little bit careful about the level of, of um, saving there. And we put a couple of figures in that you can see between 600,000 and 1.2 million. We'll monitor that, particularly over the next 12 months, to see what the pattern is. Because as we start to um, properly work in a hybrid way, in the ways that we, we described in the previous report, um, get to a situation where we understand what the long-term pattern of business travel demands on that. And then paragraph 15, um, there's a, a disposal of, of a locality site is planned. Again, commercial sensitivity around that, but we're anticipating a capital receipt of 800,000 from 23, 24. So some of this is looking medium and long term. Moving on to paragraph 16, um, as you would expect with the size of this programme and the number of staff who are, are, in, um, are impacted by it, there is some one-off expenditure, which again is costed and included within the MTFS so that we can deliver those savings. 
So we've got some specific staff resources to and particularly around um, property, um, IT and organisation development or, or change professionals. Um, then there's the cost of dilapidations and refurbishment to enable building exits. Um, and again, in some ways, that's business as usual, but we built it into the programme where we've got specific plans because of the programme. And then an investment in our future office model. So I've mentioned the pilot um, in room 700 and assuming that pilot is successful and we start to adapt other floors for a much more modern way of working, then there'll be some one off investment in in those. So the table then summarises um, that position. Um, and inevitably there will be some ongoing costs as well. So from an IT perspective, although the majority of, of the IT provision is in is, is kind of business as usual, the elements that are within the program are that facilitation to um, a, a full laptop estate um, and some increase in staffing to maintain that. Um, and so the costs are, are, are there. Um, and it's things like remote access, phones, peripherals, rather than the core infrastructure, which is, is sits in the core IT budgets. So paragraph 18, um, what we've summarised is just lifting all those sets of figures from the previous paragraphs and previous sections and, and just giving you a picture of the, the overall impact. Um, and you can see the bottom line MTFS savings target by 2526, so the first four years of the length of program um, just under 1.7 billion net savings over a five-year period in paragraph 19 3.3 million with a payback period of 5.2 years um, and as we've said I've, I've said a couple of times around looking for nine years we've got further opportunities longer term financial savings um, not just in terms of our, protect, our projections around um, uh, mileage and then business mileage claims and um, increasing our rental income, but also things like printing, um, commercial income, and then the ability to generate further income. So we've got a blueprint absolutely nailed there, and we can see what else we can potentially lease out. Um, just around governance, um, we have a ways of working programme board and, and just picking up the point from the previous report, uh, the conversation, the previous report, it's the start, not the end. So that governance will continue, we'll continue to monitor very carefully. Um, so that's an officer board um, and we will keep obviously employment committee updated um, for the people aspects. Trade unions are heavily involved and departmental management teams are crucial to this. And then engagement. Um, We've had significant engagement with uh, staff and managers, um, both in the original plans for the programme and then during the pandemic to change and shape the programme into its current form. Um, and we also had a cross party members working group um, a couple of years ago, which um, was very much of a, a response to COVID and recovery plans and ways of working fed strongly into that as well and has helped to shape the programme. Um, and, and position us as an authority around a, a future model. And then just finally, um, resource implications. You can see the net cost, again, summarising from previous paragraphs, the net cost of implementing the programme, 4 million over eight years, included in the MTF, MTFS on a spend to save basis. Um, so we're very much looking at the financial benefits of the investment, um, resource requirements and the um, all the figures have been approved and are in the MTFS and, and agreed within the programme. And then just for completeness, a couple of key risks that we've pulled out because we programme of a size and magnitude without risks. Um, so you can just see those there just for, for information as much as anything else. But we're obviously we're aware of those risks and we're working through those at the moment. And that's, um, I think, time to this is probably a little bit of a repeat so talk from me. Thank you Gordon. Um, Mr Brecken did you want to come in at this point? I think I, I, I just I, I think it's an interesting report I, I, I think the last paper talked about how we deliver the new ways of working and obviously uh, the key risk there is if managers and staff do not adapt and fully embrace the new ways of working revert to old ways I think sometimes there's comfort in old ways but I think we've had to change the way we operate as, as a business and an organisation the last two years 
And I think what we the work that the previous papers brought to it, I think it's 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 now to Gordon, David, and the senior management team to to really, with member support, deliver that. So um, it, it it is certainly embedded within um, uh, the employment committee. The report went to the employment committee in December. I chair that. So and also obviously the MTFS, which was approved by cabinet in February uh, by council in February. Uh, that's obviously my portfolio. So yeah, this is key, and, and we are very involved. But it's a good report and we now need to implement it. So we look forward to, to seeing that in action. Thank you. Okay. Do any members have any questions, Mr. Allen? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the report, Gordon. Uh, very comprehensive. Uh, just coming to paragraph 13, um, there's the note that we're vacating Pennine House and Melton Parkside. Um, could you give us a feel for how many other locations the County Council has across the county? And are those or a proportion of those under review as well, please? Thank you, Chair. Not absolutely sure off the top of my head how many other um, locations we've got because we've got to, to think about the some of our frontline services, you know, particularly in adult social care, for example, we, we have, you know, a, a, a whole range of, of properties. Um, I suppose what we're really talking about here is is where we've got um, locations for office based staff, um, you know, rather than some of those other um, and, and we are reviewing and that's kind of what I said about the, the, the commercial sensitivity because we're looking at where we've got staff in other locations, um, looking at whether we need those departments, so particularly adults and children's are kind of matching that sort of challenge with their need for a locality presence and how that will work. Um, so those conversations are ongoing, but I, I think suffice to say we are looking to to reduce and rationalise the office estate, if you like, particularly um, those smaller offices um, and to make sure that we've still got that right locality presence. So through hybrid working or physical presence, etc., it works for our customers. Sorry, that's a bit of a, a, a roundabout answer, but you understand why I think. Yeah, OK. Thank you, um, Mrs Page. And thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Gordon. Uh, to just reiterate, very good report. Um, key risk were mentioned three times, and I was wondering, uh, are you looking at a strategy and incentives to, uh, you know, um, overcome these key risks because I think this is, as you said, very, very important that you do uh, address them in order to deliver this, uh, this strategy. And my other point is we know that IT and mobile phones have got a very, very large carbon footprint. However, um, doing some of the things like room 700, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, does actually um, lower our carbon footprint. So, have you evaluated the two against each other? And probably it would be nice to consider to form it as part of the report because the overall strategy, as this at the council, is to reduce the carbon footprint, and this actually adds a great deal to it. And there is no mention of it. Thank you. Good report. Uh, thank you. So I'll pick up on the, the first question, which was around the risks. So in terms of how we're addressing both of those risks, so the first one primarily is around reverting to, to old ways of working, obviously something we're, we're keen to, to not encourage. So there's a lot of work that's gone into this, and this is where, um, I said previously, one size doesn't fit all. So we're really targeting managers at a service level for them to ask every question about what do they need to do to effectively deliver. So that's the main mechanism in which we're addressing this risk, and that's by giving managers the support and tools and guidance throughout the programme for them to make the right decisions for their service. The big thing they need to factor in, of course, is service delivery, customer requirements, and then staff flexibility. So they're getting a lot of support, and that's a key backbone of the next year that we'll, we'll continue with. So that's really the main mechanism for, for obviously driving that forward. Uh, we do have a lot of support, and it's outlined in the report around resourcing. We have invested in resourcing from an OD um, aspect to support with the culture change, and that will equally be as, as crucial to, to driving that. Um, the the second part of that is the future office model. So the reason we are investing is that is it's important that we do. 
Um, without that, we can't fully achieve the culture change we need. So by taking everyone on that journey and a lot of the recommendations that came from the task and finish group are flowing into this to, to really support with, with driving that right culture change. Um, th there will be pockets of it where there'll be that a tendency to move back and will of course provide additional support there but I think looking at what's coming out from the business um, very much the, the discussions we're having is pointing in the right direction. Um, picking up the second question with regards to carbon, uh, we are working very closely. We do have a carbon reduction programme running as, as well within within uh, the council. We do work very closely with them. And I think for me, I don't have the detailed figures in front of me today, but we could be quite easily uh, bring that back. Um, from a carbon perspective, all of the investment we've made in our, our new laptops, for example, our new monitors within the office as part of our procurement process, carbon has been considered. So they are um, low energy outputs um, and we are replacing. Um, so it's not adding to our estate, we're replacing desktops, etc., older laptops and monitors, um, which of course have got much um, less in environmentally friendly output. Um, so I don't have the exact figures today, but confident we are being more energy friendly with it. Um, and then of course, there's the wider benefits of that in terms of business travel, etc., to factor in. Do we have any more questions on this report? Um, if not, uh, thank you to Gordon and David and Mr. Brecken for attending and answering questions and presenting today. Did you have any final comments on the report? We'll move on to the next slide. No. OK, well, thank you very much for your um, attendance and, and, and uh, speaking to us today. So next we have item 11, which is the outcome of the consultation on the revised strategic plan with Item 10, which is on the next item, is the 2021-2022 medium term financial strategy monitoring, which is on page 43 to 47 of the agenda pack. We have Chris Tambini, Director of Corporate Resources, and Declan Keegan, the Assistant Director, here to introduce the item today. And the lead member for resources, Mr Brecken, will also remain with us for this item. So uh, over to you when you're ready, Chris. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be pretty brief because Declan's going to take you through the detail. But I suppose just a bit of context to this budget monitoring. It, the, the budget was actually put together in winter, come to 2021. And if people remember back to winter 2021, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. I think that was the year Christmas was cancelled. I think we just started vaccination. So we put together the budget with that level of uncertainty. And clearly, during the year, there's been more uncertainty and more kind of different events happening. So given that, I think it's quite a reasonable result in terms of the overall picture, we must admit. Having said that, I think there's, there's, there's three key risks, or not risks, they're, they're actually issues. Um, one is special education needs, which I know the committee are very familiar with, pressures around adult social care, and also the pressures around capital. I'm going to stop there because I don't, I don't want to kind of steal any thunder from Declan when he can take you through the report. Thanks, Chris. So as mentioned, this period 10 monitoring, last time we came to screen to present was period six. And the, the movements in truth have, have been broadly positive. So it's kind of, I suppose, a, a feeling of a bit of relief of where we where we could have been. So I'll, I'll again, it's similar to Chris, I'll only do a, do a short summary. I'll go through revenue first and take questions, um, if that's all right with the chair, and then sort of do capital after that to just break it up a little bit. So as, as mentioned, things have, things have improved. We're now expecting a small underspend of 3.5 million, which where we were in period six was a sort of a slight overspend of, of 2.6. And if you can remember further back in the year, we were expecting a, a fairly kind of torrid time. But it's kind of the, I suppose, the virus has progressed and the government's reaction to the virus has sort of gradually eased and eased and eased. Some of those kind of provisions and sort of contingencies we put in place haven't been required. But also some of the actions taken to place to get down the overspend have started to, uh, to, to yield some, some results as well. So I mean, in terms of those main movements from period six, it's primarily adult social care and environment and transport departments have improved adults is primarily service demand which is has come down which is obviously positive for the sort of the future years of the mtfs as, as well and environment and transport is primarily sort of split between two things sen transport demand which is eased off over the uh, over the period partly because of uptake which may bounce bounce back obviously but also external incomes being being come which this sort of the report goes into a, a little bit of detail in terms of the variances that we are holding at period 10 themselves, Chris touched on this, but SCND is by far the biggest concern. It's the area that hasn't hasn't improved. Actually, it's got a little bit worse since period six. 
that we're now spending just short of £11 million above the grant that we received from government. And that grant has been increasing quite considerably over the last few years. So the deficit by the time we get to the end of this year is going to be £28 million. And as you'll remember from the MTFS, this is expected to just keep growing over the next year next four years to about sort of 60 million pounds so although we do kind of we do budget for that sort of overspend to make sure we've got the cash to pay for it even that sort of that 11 million pound is five million pound what we expected kind of a, a year ago so it is a is a big problem and it's a growing problem and government are increasingly re, uh, recognizing this both through sort of additional sort of funding which hasn't been enough but also additional engagement with authorities and although we're not in the kind of the the worst category of overspend where they get this kind of safety valve thing which attracts extra funding we are in the sort of the, the next sort of level down where they're going to come and sort of create increased sort of support and sort of uh, advice and probably sort of quite a degree of oversight as well so but we do expect out of that sort of government engagement and to just reinforce that it is a local problem that we've got to to deal with so we it's obvious that we've got to increase i suppose the level of ambition that we've got in terms of our kind of a, a demand diversion or cost reduction type activity so, so newton europe were were commissioned to to produce a sort of a i suppose do a bit of a diagnostic but also sort of provide recommendations of how we can up our kind of our, our ambition in this area so hopefully that'll kind of yield some positive news next time we're next time we're here um, first, the big sort of um, departments in the report is children's and family services. Unusual for children that it is underspending. It's obviously kind of still spending quite a bit more than previous year, so it's still a way to go before. I suppose you could describe it as a sustainable level of growth, but it is positive nonetheless that the, the placements have, have plateaued over the years. Adults and communities still over overspending. It's come down quite a bit, and the the big kind of I suppose bear trap for us in here is there's an awful lot of NHS income in there, both through the sort of the, the formal national discharge scheme, but also local agreements as well. So got to be really mindful of, of that. But that said, the number of service users and the cost of new placements has been easy enough, starting to head towards a, a more normal level. Um, other area of kind of bit of concern in their corporate resources is overspending at the moment by about a million pounds. The actually the underlying problem here is the commercial services which again has been sort of well trailed before and half of that has, has been mitigated half it can't we've had to reset the targets as it were for the commercial areas through the mtfs but it's it's still to be seen you know can we manage those those services through sort of a, a period that's going to see exceptional kind of growth in things like the national living wage and the and the cost base and not necessarily that sort of a corresponding income increase income increases at in education establishments which are our, our main customers in terms of it going into sort of like beyond the departments into the sort of the overall corporate position, funding's been really positive for us. It's held up far better than we feared, particularly on the council tax side of things. And, and between council tax and business rates, we're getting another £7 million above the MTFS. So that's really helped to, to mop up a lot of the um, those overspends and actually tip us into that, that underspend, as I mentioned. So it's quite good to pause there. If there's any sort of comments or questions, Chair? Any comments, questions on the revenue part? Uh, Mr. Barclay. Thanks very much. Uh, it, it is good news. Um, we, we've gone from a 2.6 million overspend down to a 3.5 million underspend, which is great. And I, I fully appreciate you've highlighted the SEND 28 million accumulated shortfall as being a real problem. But from what you've said, the government is more or less intimating that they're not going to provide any more help. You've had your grant and it really is a problem for the council. They're not going to come in and wipe out that deficit. Is that correct? It, it seems to be sort of, that seems to be the way it's going. The people who've had this sort of safety valve um, sort of agreements, they've had a little bit of extra money, but it's, I think it's been a bit of a one-off sort of take it or leave it type arrangement. So it broadly has been turned back and said, the reforms are fine, it's a local problem, you know, you've got to, to deal with it. So basically, yes. Uh, Mr. Poland. Thank you. Um, another question about the uh, SEND part of the budget, really. Forgive me if this is not this is not probably the best question for yourselves. I and mean, that's the case, just, just pass it right back to me. But in terms of why the SEND budget is going, the, the cost is getting more and more each each year. Is this a one off or is this part of a general trend that it's increasing sort of year on year? And if the latter is the case, why is that effectively? Is that because historically we've missed children that should have been receiving money? Or is it the, the case that we've widened the definition of what, you know, yeah, what what SEND actually encompasses? 
I think like it seems to be much more of the, the latter, the worth um, reforms in SCND sort of several years ago now, which did a did a couple of things. One, it's one it increased the age great age range of children that we look after. So that went very much from kind of up to 18 to up to 24. So suddenly you've kind of got a instead of sort of children dropping out of the system, suddenly they just sort of stay within the system. But also it massively increased expectations of, of parents as well about what they should have should expect so maybe sort of children that have stayed within a mainstream setting before and now sort of got greater expectations maybe getting extra support in special schools or even independent schools in truth as well so it's it's very much the latter the kind of the i suppose that the rules of the game have changed and kind of we're, we're kind of left holding the sort of the baby as it were could i could i just add i, I think there's also been i mean the work new in europe have done they've obviously done peer sort of measurements and reviews and I think Leicester County Council has always offered a gold standard. I think the culture that we've had across our staff, the departmental culture is if a children need a children, a child will get. And I think part of the work that Newton Europe have done is say, yeah, you can still offer a silver service or a bronze service and deliver. And I think part of what we're looking at now is is to do that. But I mean, certainly it comes back that, that you know, the grant isn't sufficient. Um, and however we deliver that, we've always done that job to the very best. Uh, but that is now being reviewed and that's been looked at. Newton Europe have helped us with that work by looking at other councils out there that are doing the work, still delivering, but doing it in a different sense. So again, it goes back to the first item that we looked at. I mean, it, it's how we, um, you know, the ways of working, um, you know, it is that departmental culture. Um, I think Jane recognises it as director and I think certainly uh, Deborah recognises it as a lead member. I think that's some work that will be done. I think we'll start to see the benefits of it. But at the moment, we have that huge um, end of year figure of 28 million. And yeah, we're aware of it. Uh, the government's aware of it. And we wait to see where that will be at the end of the MTFS period. It, 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 it's it's a very scary figure, but you know, we are aware. So. Mr Hunt. Well, some of these matters will probably be more uh, relevant to the particular scrutiny committee. So I'm, uh, I'm not looking for great depth here. Um, uh, there was a, um, a moment uh, a few months ago when we were looking to transfer some money from the mainstream uh, schools budget to the high needs. Um, did that did that happen? And and uh, what was the, you know, how, how how were we managing w without that if we didn't get it? Um, there's another question I had further down, which is on how on earth you could get a million pound underspend public health during during a uh, global pandemic. Um, and it seems to me that I mean they've got quite a lot on their plate, and just just question why that wasn't uh, used. But that's possibly something for the scrutiny committee rather than for the committee. I think probably they're the two. I'll take them in reverse order because the public health one's easier, but I, I think it's basically just because they've got so much on the plate is why they've underspent to be, to be quite honest. So they've got, they've had lots of other funding streams to deal with the sort of pandemic, sort of mm. contained funding, etc. So that as, as efforts divert onto there, obviously kind of got services and some of their services are very kind of public facing as well. So the, the level of demand from the public's likely to have dropped off down. But it's just basically the prioritising within the, in the departments and and we, we get the government granting at a sort of a fixed level. We don't sort of set that, so we never have an opportunity to fix the budget. But what we will do is move that public health and move on to a public health reserve. And then they'll counterintuitive. Absolutely. Yeah. I think okay. if you saw the overall picture sort of with the grant coming in, you see like an increase in the public health expenditure just because of that sort of pandemic reaction type stuff. But no, it's a, it's a fair point. It's very counterintuitive. In terms of the mainstream transfer, we obviously um, the first stage of that is to go to sort of schools forum and ask them are they willing to give up um, some of their money to help with the sort of the, the high needs deficit and it's a the order of magnitude is about two million million pounds so it's not kind of a it's not a game changer in the overall scheme of things but it is important in terms of that making sure we're doing everything that we possibly can and also kind of trying to trying to keep schools involved in sort of solving the problem as well but they predictably enough and it was expected schools forum declined the transfer so the next stage is then you go to the secretary of state and it's fully expected the secretary of state will say uh, no, I think actually has done. Am I right in saying that? And the Secretary of State has turned us down now as well, which again was pretty expected. But again, it's just that dripping tap with people like the Secretary of State that you know there's a problem here. And kind of we're doing everything. So I've just had. I was quite disturbed at the um, 
uh, the paragraph on on the social workers and, and their workloads and, and the recruitment they're both working against against us and i i kind of thought that maybe the way they're coping in that department is by not taking uh, children who would be SEND out of school, keeping them in school, uh, in mainstream school. And, you know, behind that, there's quite a few questions I would have thought about these things, but that may be for the children, families, maybe they've even dealt with it. I'd, I'm concerned about that. Just quickly, I think you're right, if you want to get into sort of the details, it's kind of a department's best place, but I suppose it's, the social care team is different to the SEND team, so the kind of the assessment of kind of what, what SEND support they get is different to sort of the level of sort of social care, so where that provides a little bit of reassurance, but it's it's difficult on the social work side because everybody's chasing social workers at the moment. It's a, again a national problem, unfortunately. Okay, um, did you want to move on to the capital part, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, capital is very brief. Um, we're expecting this year to spend £96 million out of £118 million budget. So obviously that gives about £22 million. And it is it is primarily slippage. There's a few bits and pieces in there, but there are the, the margins of other things. So £6 million of, of that was relating to schools, and that is just delays of schools into the next financial year. Obviously, the key thing is that kind of a, they tend to work on academic years rather than financial years. So that's just a bit of a slip, but I expect it to have too detrimental an impact. And then the big one's 13 million on transport delays and actually just boils down to two schemes, which kind of does reflect how one or like the bulk of its two schemes, how, how sort of the, the capital programmes change. We've got 7 million on the Melton Mowbray Road and 3 million on the Hinkley Hub. That, you know, just much bigger schemes. So you're just going to going to see much bigger figures sort of move around as we as we go forward over the next few years. Um, one, th one area I did want to draw uh, members' attention to is the final paragraph, sort of 54, which just sort of talks about sort of Homes England grant that we're going to sort of uh, give back. We, in some ways we didn't have a huge amount of choice because sort of planning permission hasn't been received yet for the development east of east of Lutterworth. But the the work in terms of other sites where we've sort of been been going to sort of uh, market and sort of trying to sell sites, um, what we've seen is the grant conditions actually sort of a, they are quite onerous for sort of for home builders. So actually the sort of the, the market value increase is broadly the same as the sort of the, the loss in grants. Although it's always always painful having to give money back or turn money down in this. In this case, it doesn't feel like the, the long term impact will be, will be sort of detrimental financially. I have to take any questions or comments. Mr. Hunt. Broadly relates to paragraph 50 on page 52, the environment and transport. Um, the two particular things concern me, and they may well have been approached with a consultancy that took place after the um, Melton uh, debacle. Um, the difficulty we had getting um, uh, the full funding for these expensive highway projects. Loughborough was, A512 was another one that was, I think, two million short. We had to go to the rep to find it in, eventually. So we, we've got a pretty hefty capital programme for transport, particularly. And we're bidding for more, and at the same time we're slipping the slippage on the programme we've got for the reasons that you've outlined in the report. Understandable, pandemic and so on. And and um, so there was a sort of warning light, which which uh, um, triggered this consultancy report. Um, slippage. But also the extra factors, particularly inflation, which is is, is looking to be very um, difficult in the next year. It makes me think that we're doing too much and we're employing a lot of officers to do um, design work for projects that may not happen in the foreseeable future. I'll have a go at this one. I mean, you, you're right, the capital programme is hefty. I mean, look at the one we just agreed for the next four years, it's over half a billion, very big capital programme. Nearly half of that is, is transportation projects. Mm. I, mean, I, I think you've probably heard me say this before, is, is we, we've got we've got two big schemes, two big transport schemes in there. One is obviously the, 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 the Mount and Mowbray kind of schemes, and then you've got the A511. And, I, and I've kind of said kind of previously that as an authority, 
it is problematic to do another major highway scheme over and above those two just because of the costs. And, 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 you, and you're right, the, the costs have escalated, but if you look at kind of what's happened over the last couple of weeks, I think there's only one way the cost of the capital scheme is going to go, and that's going to be even higher. So that there are some some big risks. So I think it is something we will be have to revisit a bit this year in terms of the affordability of the capital programme, particularly given the inevitable escalating costs that there will be over the coming year. But yeah, it, it is an issue, and that's why I kind of flagged it in my intro as, as being an issue. And I think it's on the um, work programme of, of the scrutiny commission, isn't it? I think there's going to be a future report around the capital programme and get into it in a bit more detail. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, there is, there is a schedule. Um, Mr. Galton, did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. I think um, that's very helpful information that Max has drawn out and Chris has explained. Um, and of course, it's inextricably linked to paragraphs in the MTFS about how we're going to fund growth and infrastructure and the risks involved to the County Council in that and the fact that Section 106 historically is highway funding isn't been, developers has never been enough. There's always been a big gap uh, which has to be funded from somewhere. Um, and obviously we are looking to have these agreements with the planning authorities to share some of that risk, um, which we've had a mixed result on and it's work in progress and understand that. But I do think it's important with what Mr said this morning is that we link that to the growth agenda. Because if the infrastructure is not affordable or can't be delivered, then we have to raise a big question about some of this planned growth, which I know we're going to be looking at later and so on. It does bother me that at the moment the two are absolutely kind of separated. You've got the mag, which I know we've looked at before and we'll look at again, sitting there doing all this planning as planners like to do. No criticism of any planners in the room, but that's what planners do, isn't it? Um, but how are we going to afford the infrastructure or we're going to end up as, as is usual with development going ahead without needed infrastructure and all the consequences that we know so well about that. So I do think it's important. I think there's a role for this commission as it looks after the money as well as the strategic overseeing strategic planning that somehow these two issues get pulled together and don't just carry on in silos. Jim. If I could respond respond to, to, to that, it, just in terms of the, sorry, the, the, the money and the kind of planning being separated, actually over the last kind of, I suppose, three or four years, we've done quite a lot to kind of join that up. So we have got the growth unit now, it kind of sits across and it, and it does have a big remit in terms of funding. And I mean, I, I, I kind of chair the kind of the, the weekly group on it. So I kind of, you know, so, so we, we are aware that of, of how it does need to be joined up with financial plans. and. I suppose just to reiterate that I suppose the, the issue, because you because you are right, the, the issues around section 106 funding and some of these kind of big infrastructure schemes. I mean, we've talked about our capital programme and the, the cost escalation, etc. But clearly developers are having the same issue with their, their own schemes. So what was viable maybe two years ago is possibly not going to be viable in a year's time. So it, it does it does squeeze the amount of funding envelope that is available. Hence why I think we do need to have a kind of look at the capital programme and just kind of check that kind of what we've got in there is, is kind of sensible. The only thing I'd, I suppose I'd add to that is um, it's just the, you know, the impact of the cost of living kind of, kind of crisis, as it's been called, is going to have on. Members have any questions? No, so thank you, Declan and Chris and Mr. Brecker.
Ashley Epps, Senior Policy Officer. The lead member for Community and Staff Relations, Mrs Posnett, has also joined us for this item. Welcome, Mrs Posnett. So over to you, Tom. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I'll say a few words um, very briefly by way of introduction and then hand over to Ashley, who will um, perhaps take you a little bit through the report. But we will focus very much on the comments that have been made on the plan and the changes that we've made as a result. And um, we won't repeat sort of a summary of the plan as a whole, which happened. Um, and, and clearly provides an important strategic framework for the work of the council. We, we held a 16 week public consultation period and um, the report sets out the consultation activities that were undertaken. So we, we, we did quite a lot of things, some new things to try and maximise the, uh, the, the responses that we received. And um, just to mention the process after today, obviously the comments we received today from you were considered in finalising the plan before it go into the cabinet on the 29th of March and then council 18th of May. So I'll hand over to Ashley now just to summarise the comments received and changes made. Thank you. Um, so during public consultation on the plan, um, a variety of channels and methods were used to engage stakeholders. Um, so that included a public survey that um, got 259 responses, um, direct engagement of scrutiny committees and the commission, obviously, along with partnership boards, community groups and uh, staff worker groups, um, and then also briefings for county council members and officers. Um, including three briefings for officers which use an interactive platform to gauge the views of over 200 officers. Um, that compares well to other sort of uh, response rates to other sort of um, strategies at this sort of level, um, as we tend to see uh, responses above 100 as, as being sort of successful, and obviously we've got over 450 um, for this consultation. Um, so in terms of key findings, um, there was a high level of support for the outcomes which summarise the Council's vision. Um, so 80% of public survey uh, respondents agreed with the outcomes um, and only 10% disagreed. Um, however, the outcome with the least, albeit still substantial uh, support, was the strong economy, transport and infrastructure outcome, um, which around housing um, and moved the key actions to support housing development instead to the um, out the sub outcome around infrastructure. Uh, Um, linked to, to that concern, um, there was also um, some suggested that the clean and green outcome um, may not be compatible with the strong economy, transport and infrastructure outcome, um, primarily due to developments um, and the impact of that on sort of the environment. Um, A further bit of feedback was that the plan seemed too long, um, so we've reduced the word count by 25% um, by removing unnecessary text. Um, and we've also added images to the plan to improve its kind of visual appeal and try and break up some of the long sections of text. Um, so the plan length has decreased from 45 to 40 pages. Um, it would have been down to 35 if we hadn't added the images, but we felt that that was sort of helpful for the making it engaging. 
Um, a further, further bit of feedback was that the plan includes aspirations which are outside the county council's control um, and that the plan doesn't sufficiently mention the work of district councils. Um, so in response to that, I'd say the, the plan reflects that in order to deliver its vision for Leicestershire, uh, the council will need to be specific aims and actions. And the glossary also now includes a definition of party. Um, examples of effective collaboration. targets to reflect current service capacity and pressures. Um, if we added too many specific targets to the strategic the Supporting Families programme. Additionally, each sub outcome now includes under how we will measure success, the key performance indicators that will be monitored to identify if each aim is being achieved. Um, so Um, grouped by outcome. Um, I think that was everything I was going to cover now, so thank you. Thank you for the detailed uh, outline of the um, consultation, Ashley. Uh, did you want to make a comment, Mrs Posner, before we open up for some <coughs> questions? Yeah, um, I mean, I would uh, just like to make one or two points that you'll pl be pleased Um, and I think also that the work that district councils do uh, has been acknowledged in the way that we, we can and will actually work with district councils to make sure that the strategic plan uh, meets its, its aims. Um, there's a little bit more about prevention. Um, we've explained the different levels of participation. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong bit. We've defined partners, we've um, highlighted the partners we've been working with um, and how we will maintain transport, etc. So I think all the important things are there uh, in a slightly different way, but an easier way to read. Thank you. So, um, Mr Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for the report. I'm just a, a little bit confused with the numbers, particularly in paragraph six, where it says you've had 259 respondees. Uh, and then later on is uh, two. small minority of the population 
and base all the you know the findings of the reports on just that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so sorry, just to clarify, the um, it is 459 basically overall because um, we had 259 responses to the public survey and then uh, over 200 officers attended these uh, internal briefings where they provided views um, through an interactive sort of mentor user platform. Um, and yeah, in terms of the um, two proposals one was to kind of um uh, suggest to head teachers that we can uh, run a session on sort of the role of the council and local democracy how decisions are made and then weave into that some sort of poll questions for students um to capture their views um and the other was obviously those internal briefings for staff um yeah if i could just very briefly add a couple of plan is, is, is quite a bit high. Yeah, thanks for that. Could it be the quality of the questions? And you know, are we are we appealing? Are we asking the right questions? Because you can have a survey with a thousand questions or thirty questions. It's going to take an hour and some out of somebody's day. But if you're asking three very short, sharp to the point questions, but to a larger number of people, you're going to have lots of bit size information that you'll be able to extrapolate some some good really good information from. No, I think that, I think that's a fair comment, and we can certainly look at that. But we, we we do we do look at how we pitch the questions. Clearly, there's something about getting the right level of detail back, but also you don't want to be giving people a very long questionnaire because they're not going to want to to, to start a really long exercise like that. So, um, you know, that is something that we do we do, we do consider. But happy to look again at that for future exercises. Stand. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't normally. Uh, read these actually this is a, 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 a confession but they only come around once every four years or so uh, so perhaps I could be forgiven for that um as you know I put in some comments mainly on 5.2 um which is um about Five point two, but that's not something I want to uh, tackle now. Um, just uneasy about um, why we're singling out neighbourhood plans um, to go in our corporate plan. And the other point was uh, 
parish councils. See where I'm going with this. Um, oh, and uh, the other lot um, will will do support everybody. Uh, but that, that's basically what we're saying. We're saying we support town and parish councils, and because we don't support um, non-parish councils, non-parish non areas. Um, we're, Thank you. Um, thanks. Yeah, so on the neighbourhood plans, um, we took on board feedback last time uh, that it's not sort of something that the county council leads. We should sort of tone down our references to it. So I think in the previous plan we previously presented, um, we had an aim around sort of um, an increase in the number of neighbourhood plans in Leicestershire. Um, we removed that aim in, from this uh, version, um, but we've kept an action to kind of support the development of neighbourhood plans because the county council does have a role in sort of supporting development of neighbourhood plans, albeit not as, as sort of hands on as the district council's role. Um, and then um, in terms of district councils, we've, we've um, strengthened references to district councils throughout the document um in in many different places really um but but yeah I'm not sure about that specific example that we can take away maybe and look at um and then finally on town and parish councils um yeah i think in the in the covering report i've sort of tried to mention that um our sub outcome 5.2 about sort of public participation um is intending to Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Page, did you? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Course you can't cover everything. I mean, when I went through it, I've looked at things like uh, how do we measure success? Number of new houses completed. Well, we can't because it goes within local plans and it is a district one. But then. Back to uh, uh, Mr. Smith's point on the consultation. And you did say it is quite good in considering to usual, but and I know consultations and our process and we've tried it all uh, has come to scrutiny and it is difficult to engage people. Um, and if I recall the city's one on the parking place one, you've got a long one and then you've got a very short one. You know, you can go to one of those. But the question um, to just add a little bit more meat on the bones of Councillor Smith's question is what is actually, <clears throat> and I know these consultations are imposed on us by government. Hold on. Thank you very much, Mrs. Page, for the positive 
um, comments. Um, the strategic plan isn't a statutory document, so we're not sort of bound by statutory consultation requirements, but I think it's generally accepted that a 12 week consultation period is, is good practice because it gives people and organisations long enough to get responses in. Um, uh, you know, that wouldn't give us the opportunity to have a stronger plan as possible. And I think also we'd come under lots of criticism from people who weren't giving them the opportunity to influence something. In terms of is it worth it, which I think is what the other question you had, I think I, I think the process that we've been through since the last scrutiny commission meeting and today and the changes that have been made to the plan, I think I would argue that this is a better plan than the one we presented to you initially because of the comments that we've received from you, but also from members of the public and staff and, 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 and others. And I think, um, you know, the fact that we've made the short, that we've made the plan a bit tighter and shorter, but without losing the substance of it and, and the number of detailed changes we've made, I think that, that shows the value of a consultation exercise. So I would say it definitely is worth it. And I think we So there's many people in the county that want to read. about who sort of want to who we want to sort of consult with in this case i guess the audience is ask everyone to do 100 different consultations you might not get them to do any but if you approach a certain group you know size and volunteers or whatever it might be and say you've got specific you know specific We need to consult in terms of public, you know, get, to allow the public to have their say. But again, it's just thinking about who are we consulting and why effectively, um, I guess, is the point I'm making. In terms of neighbourhood plans, Max talked about it. I, I've got to say that was one I highlighted in, in, in my document as well, if I'm honest with you. Um, we talked about the document before talked about increasing the number of neighbourhood plans. Um, but you talked about supporting, and I think supporting is is the key point. Neighbourhood plans are great if it's right for the neighbourhood in question. It's not necessarily right for every neighbourhood, and I think it can be a double-edged sword, if I'm honest. Um, in my own ward at the moment, in the borough of Charmwood, got issues with, with as a result of neighbourhood plans being effect not quite sold as one thing but people believe neighborhood plans could do were, were something that could come in in order to you put three years of your life into it you put money into it and yes we will allow building there but that means we'll save this that and the other field and then
but they're not a universally positive thing either. They, they're, they're more nuanced than that. And I think he's sort of saying get everyone to have one maybe isn't appropriate for everyone. But design our consultation exercises depending on the subject matter that we're consulting on and so we will target particular groups so for example if we're um, uh, con consulting on, on an economic policy then we'll, we'll focus more on businesses than we might in relation to some other uh, other issues and obviously the strategic plan is an overarching other places and, and make sure that we're doing item for today which is item 12 the draft communities strategy Leicestershire County Council collaborating with our communities our communities approach 2022-2026 feedback from community and engagement this is on pages 127 to 150 of the agenda pack so far Salim head of communities will be introducing this item supported by Christy Ball communities team leader the lead member, Mrs. Posner, is also remaining with us for this item. So over to you, Zafar. Thank you, Chair. Um, responses um, for example and, uh, and potentially uh, discussions around neighborhood areas uh, 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 and parished areas and unparished areas so I won't necessarily preempt them but I'm happy to take questions on them as, as they arrive so in t uh, so this is a similar approach to um, uh, Tom's presentation in that Uh, to raise any other matters um, um, or, or queries, and then this document uh, will be presented to full to to cabinet um, for approval on the 29th of March. In terms of the the methodology, it was the same methodology. So initially, it was a 12-week consultation process that was extended to 16 weeks. Um, we have attempted. Uh, new approaches um you know i'm happy on another day to come back and go in a, a far more detail in terms of how the council approaches consultation and community involvement because that's one of the service areas that falls um, and, under tom and i as, as well and i can give uh, members uh, uh, our assurance that we are looking at more innovative approaches because we are aware acutely aware that you know with, with something which is very strategic the number of responses is quite low in comparison to the many thousands of responses we had to say for example the walking and cycling strategy so i think where something means something directly to them then clearly communities will respond and similarly if we had you know a capacity or capability to go out and do community road shows i guess that would that would gather more information as, as well and they are some of the things we are looking at together with maybe more more using facebook maybe using instagram snapchat those other ways that 
a more modern ways that certainly younger people do engage with. So, um, and that's all picked up as part of this new communities approach. So, on that, uh, Chair, I'll probably hand over to Christy to cover this. strategy the community's approach and actually by coming here and offering briefing Whilst there may be broader agreement and we've got numbers here of people that filled out a survey, there was much more around conversations, involvement, coming to training, actually offering asset based training alongside this. So the main aim for us was really that raise awareness of it and actually refresh where we need to. Um, broadly, people were in support of the principles. Um, that's really good to know. But a lot of people did suggest ways in which we could embed this further, how we could go about incorporating as much as we can around that partnership working. And we've made reference to all of our partners in the participation principle, but also about what people can do for themselves and what they're already doing. So it really did help us think about what we're going to do. So. We did increase the um, period of time from the 12 weeks to the 16 weeks to be um, the same as a strategic plan. And so during that period of time, we were able to hold a number of things that we are calling conversations, which are Mr Smith's three questions, um, but much more, <laughs> but not necessarily able to quantify. Following on, we've mentioned around the Scrooge Commission and in the presentation I gave to members, there was some clarification around the Rural Community Council and LRALC. And if anybody else does want to find out further information, then please do ask. Um, we've continued to support the role of volunteering. You can see that that's in here too. But the main thing on... and it's something that you have been mentioning already this morning was the principle and feedback but actually there's other things that we can do and as Zaf has mentioned we are looking at these and how we go around doing these things is really key. Um, I'm just going to mention that we have had broad support for all of the principles but the catalyst one has one that's continued to be in there and again we do mention voluntary and community sector organisations, social enterprise and parish and town councils as those anchor organisations within communities. Um, we do know that there's a huge difference. We know that lots of areas have parish meetings, different varying parish and town councils, but we do see those as organisations we can maybe work with to help and support communities in their local setting. And obviously that was part of the previous communities strategy and has continued to be one here. The main other change, and in order to avoid adding any more pages to this document, is that we have been working in the background on strengthening the asset-based approaches. 
in the scrutiny paper, I mention a website. In the actual report, we've put in a link, a hyperlink. However, the eagle-eyed amongst you will know that that doesn't actually work. Um, I do apologise, and an updated page will be saved with the document for the um, for the minutes. I've, I've let Joe know and clarified. We tried to shorten it, but we shortened it too much. It just needs an extra word in there. But what that will mean is that there'll be a dedicated resource to help with the asset-based approach in showing how the these approaches can support all kinds of activities that we're doing. So just watch this space and that will be there. So basically, in conclusion, it's it's here, it's updated, reordered, policy updates, but now the most important part is to where we go to embed it and where we go forward with, you know, improve embedding the approach not only within the authority, but having those conversations with our partners and communities to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Christy, for going into details for us there. Is Mrs. Bosnett, do you have any comments before we move um, to Well, I'd just like to um, thank Christy and the team for all the work they've done. Uh, again, they took on the comments. You've got a, short, a shorter document. They've reflected on where we were. And I don't think I could explain it any better than Christy has already explained in great detail you, uh, to you how we've communicated with residents and uh, all the communities that we possibly could do. So thank you very much for your time. Mrs Page, did you? Thank you, Chairman. And today my Oscar goes to Christy Zaffa and the team. <laughs> and now, when uh, earlier I said about what value has it added, because this is actually what I mean. There were only, what, 97 or so uh, responses. However, the whole process, in my opinion, added value. Now, your report picked up the points which uh, the Scrutiny Commission sort of questioned. There's the right rhetoric. You gave the right rhetoric in your preamble, uh, which was all there what we're looking for. And uh, I think it has uh, added value because there has been the engagement. And I think then what we've got to look at, it is the second step, like you say, embedded, get more engagement and whatever. Um, I'd just like to also uh, compliment you on the report. Now, um, not only has it been shrunk, but it is really, really pretty in the layout. I like the pictures. I like the font. It's easy to read with highlights for people probably with 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 sight difficulties. Um, I like uh, the way you, for instance, under the shires where there are the links. So when people look at it, oh yes, I like a grant. Oh yeah, there's a website. So all in all, I think it is absolutely uh, uh, brilliant. Couldn't fault it, even if I'd wanted to. So congratulations to all of your team and uh, looking forward to you having a very good response and embedding it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs Page. I will pass on the comments to our design team as well. So obviously we do the basic writing and, and trying to make it you know, the language and the style, but the design team, and it is fully accessible. We are looking for screen readers. We are looking at how we put the hyperlinks in. We are looking at describing the pictures as well. So I will pass that on and, and say thank you, but I'll also pass it on to my team. Thank you. Mr Hunt. Uh, a few comments in, in general, actually about the last report as well as this one. Um, we do like pictures. We don't like long reports, do we? But we like pictures. Um, and uh, um, that's really a comment on the early one. Um, uh, and the points that uh, Ruby, Rosie has just made, actually some of the pages in reverse, I white on black, in some cases purple on black, are not great um, for that, yeah. Um, yeah, um, and the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, just because we ask questions, uh, it doesn't mean to say we're critical of reports and uh, value them. They are all of a high quality. Um, the fact that we ask ask questions about it means that we have taken an interest in it, actually. So that's a compliment rather than a negative, even if my questions are sometimes a bit on the negative side. Um, 
Yes, I just wanted to wait one report, one 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 point on this, and and uh, it's it's really that um, you know good councillors and we all are. We're not only members of political organisations, and we set the council tax and do all the things that people think we do, um, but we also take a deep interest in in our communities. Not everybody sometimes, but. You know, most of the people I represent, I really am quite interested in. And so this really slots into what we do as councillors. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, all the more valued for that. And the final point is is on um, this business of, of parished and non-parished areas. That's a different point I'd like to make. But I think it, I think it's valuable here that um, there's been a lot of work done in the past, right back to the 19th century, of how organisations help themselves. And in summary, um, something that is sometimes referred to as mutual aid, it's the small organisations, the small parishes, the villages and so on, that find it easiest to be kind to each other, to work together and to look out, look out for each other. And that's why it's all the more difficult to do the sort of job that we're talking about here in the unparished larger urban areas because we don't naturally um, know each other. You know. Obviously we've got Facebook now so I should be worried. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks very much. Does anyone want to come back on Mr Hunt's comments or? I think you know I do I do acknowledge and agree that the, some of this work is more tricky in different areas and and we've had separate conversations with Mr Hunt and we'll be really keen to follow those up and and go through it but thank you. Thank you uh, Mr Smith. Uh, yeah thank you Chair. I just want to echo what Mrs Page said really just a, a really good document. Um, you've clearly got the balance right between consultation and engagement and this is an engaging doc document by any stretch of the imagination and uh, so I'd say, you know, if I went around Mr. Poland's for a coffee, I'd probably want to read it before he spilt his coffee and biscuits on it. So that's how good it is. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Any more comments from members? No? OK, so thank you, Zappa, Christy and Mrs. Posner for your work on this and for coming to see us today and answer questions. Thank you very much. Right, that is the last um, substantive item on the agenda. So just for information, the date of the next meeting of the Commission is scheduled to take place on Wednesday the 6th of April 2022 at 10 a.m. And finally, um, item 15, I'm advised there is no urgent items, so that brings the meeting to a close. Thank you to everyone for your attendance and contributions today. <laughs>